Burr Cafe, the first of the month, meaning it's going to be time for our Ask Me Anything session. And uh, they're always a lot of fun, so I uh, hope uh, you all came prepared with some questions to ask me. And I'm, uh, you know, do my best to answer them as always. So uh, let me do my usual commercial announcement here while the music plays for a little bit. Um, as you all know, you're, you're all members of the community, so you know about that. You know how to access it. Just remember, I have my online courses for Mastering Music Score itself, but also my theory course, my harmony course, counterpoint course, and the new gold level membership in which we are now doing this ongoing uh, music engraving workshop, which has been really exciting. People have been, you know, really enjoying this, and we've been doing a lot of cool things about learning the process of making your music look its best. And then also the uh, musicianship skills workshop. And as you saw in the newsletter this month, we're looking at the music of the Beatles. So we're just doing all sorts of cool things, and hope you all hope you will consider joining as a gold level member if you're not already. All right. So um, plenty of people uh, checking in here, which is great. And hopefully, um, hopefully uh, all goes well today. So I want to point out something um, uh, right now, if all is going well, first of all, did you hear the music? I hope you heard the music. Um, I'm looking at my version of the screen right now. And it looks different. It looks like they've rearranged some things, added some new stuff. In particular, now I see a raise hand feature. This just showed up since last week. I know nothing about it. So um, some, uh, you know, someone might want to try that uh, raise hand thing. To be honest, I don't know. I don't know how that'll work if you raise your hand, how I will be informed that someone raised their hand. So uh I guess we'll see. Um, other than that, it's hard to know if there's anything else new, um, but that's just the first thing I noticed that's new. All right, so there was a question submitted via, um, uh, you know, that came in on the community that will take a little while to get to get really into. So I wanna try to knock off some quick questions first. So, um, so Peter's question is really simple. And actually, in the music engraving workshop, I do uh, I did a whole video just on pedal marking um, on that. But let me go ahead and show you this. So I'm gonna I'm gonna add a pedal marking. I'm gonna open my palette window. Palette window here. I go to the lines palette. Uh, let me let me just make it be a piano score. So it you know I'll use the grand staff. So it looks like piano music. I'll add a, le a line break, and I'm going to add some notes in the bass clef. And I will now select this measure and add the pedal old-style pedal marking. So the question is how to get rid of the line. The line is already gone, is the answer. Um, if you look at it, it's gray here on the screen, right? That's because it's been made invisible. The way it was made invisible, you can also do yourself to any other line. I'll now open up the uh, um, the inspector. When I select this line, you'll see there's a line visible checkbox. That's saying I want a line in which the line is invisible, and this line has already been set that way. Most lines, of course, you want the line visible. That's the whole point but this line is special. It's a line where we don't want to see the line. We only want to see the text at the beginning and the end of the line, the pedal and the asterisk. So it's already been made invisible. Now, if it's distracting to see invisible things on screen, you can go to view and turn off show invisible. And now that invisible line disappears, right? So uh, you can do that for any line, right? You can you can add a volta, say. Let's add a second ending here. And then take that second ending and uncheck line visible for that. All right. So, Peter, you say that you have raised your hand. Great. So, let's see. When I return here, what do I see? What do I see telling me that you've raised your hand? If I go to the participants window. Ah. I see hands up. Okay, so I'm seeing it in the participants window, and that just tells me that that's a good window for me to want to be looking at a little more regularly. Um, 
you know, you would think maybe it would be a little nicer if it showed up somewhere more obvious while I was looking at my screen share, but, um, uh, you know, that's, um, that's fine. We'll, uh, I, I will definitely use that to help me find questions that I might have missed. So if you ask a question and, um, and I don't, acknowledge that I've seen your question, go ahead and hit the, the uh, go ahead and hit the hand up button. And so I'll know. So uh, Pentatonus or Tonus, uh, I see that you raised your hand also, but I think that was just as a test, right? You don't actually have a question that you've posted. So hopefully, Peter, that answers your question. If there's more to it, let me know. And yeah, the uh, pedal uh, the pedal video that I posted in the music engraving workshop, it's a whole video just on how all the different pedal markings work, how they actually work with the piano, different recommendations about when to use each type and things like that. So it's a pretty in-depth uh, <laughs> look at pedal, but I do specifically talk about that line visible checkbox. All right. Um, so uh, I'm going to also attempt I'm, I'm going to give Dave, I, you asked a question on the community that's a, kind of a big question, but I'm going to do my best to answer it generally and then give you the standard. If you have a specific score with a specific problem, go ahead and post it to the forum and then people can look better. But Dave's question was about timing. And it's a good question because it's one that, frankly, I wonder about a lot. Um, to what extent, like if I put in some notes, in a score. Let me open up my uh, play panel and uh, reset the volume so it's a normal volume level and then close it again. All right. Um, if I put in this chord and then play it, come on, play. Uh, let's try that again. All right, what's going on? Why would play not be playing? It played a moment ago, right? Well, that's interesting. Um, so now you get to watch me debug some playback problems. So play wasn't working for some reason. If I go to the I.O. panel, I see normal looking things here. Hmm. Um, let me... watch over on my other computer so I know what's happening a little bit. Um, so all new problem, right? I get to experience an entirely new technical problem where the play button just isn't playing. Um, so all new problem, right? Um, huh. All right. That's going to be a drag if I want to debug playback problems. Let me just try closing MuseScore and reopening it because I don't know. Don't know what to tell you. Um, close MuseScore. Reopen MuseScore. I'm, uh, let's see. Uh, so does it work if you're, I, I'll rewind. I, I don't know. It's too late now to, to find out. Let's just see if restarting fixed it. Okay. Restarting fixed it. So whatever, whatever was happening, um, whatever was happening that caused play to do nothing has fixed itself. So I'm not going to obsess any further, but let's, let me talk about the uh, issue that I was actually going to talk about. Um, right here, this chord here is on what the fourth sixteenth of the beat. This chord here is on the fourth sixteenth of the beat, right? So here we have a whole bunch of stuff happening on the fourth sixteenth of the beat. Here we also have a bass note on the fourth sixteenth of the beat. That's some um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine notes all happening at the same time. The same time 
is not actually a thing in MIDI. MIDI is sequential. That is just the way it is. MIDI is a is a was designed for keyboards to communicate with each other via a cable, right? And so when you press a note, it would send a message over that cable. And if you press several notes, even if you tried to press them at the same time, they would get sent out one at a time. That is how MIDI is designed to work. So that is the case in MuseScore also. These notes, these however many notes I just said, did I say nine, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine notes. These nine notes cannot actually be played literally at the same time. If there was a recording of all nine notes, a computer is perfectly capable of playing nine notes at once if they're all in one recording. But via MIDI synthesis, it's always going to be one at a time. So if you have enough notes that you need all played at once, those messages are all going to get sent one at a time. And it's not even about how fast your computer is. It's about the MIDI clock. MIDI has a built-in kind of clock where it kind of times things too. And so no matter how fast you send those messages, MIDI can only actually handle um, a certain rate of these messages is the best way I can describe it. So yeah, those nine notes aren't going to be played all at once. The, the last of those nine notes will be played a millisecond after the others. You know, that's just the way it is, whether it's a millisecond, five milliseconds, 0.3 milliseconds. I don't know the number, but with enough notes, there could be a perceptible delay between when the first note is played and when the last note is played, even for notes altogether. How many notes would it take before it overloads? Does that depend at all on your CPU? Does it depend at all on what sound font you're using? Maybe. I don't know. So best way, if you are experiencing any sort of question or issue about that, go to the support forum on muscore.org, post your actual score, tell us what sound fonts you're using, tell us which specific note you feel like is not all playing at once, and then uh, someone can take a look. But yeah, it is absolutely the case that they can't technically all be played exactly at once. That's just, that is just uh, the way, the way MIDI works. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to open up uh, Steiner. I think this was uh, you that asked this, if, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and we again, just check out the uh, participants thing, but I don't think I'm missing anything. Um, all right. So uh, this question is about staccato playback. And it's a really good question also, because I don't have good answers, but, but it's another one that kind of bugs me. So here's, I'm going to sing what he has written here. Um, it's a good little sight singing exercise. G, um, it looks like we're in the key of C, G, C. Boo, da, bop, 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 bop. B, da, da, da. Oh, I went all the way down to C. I'm going to get this right. Boo, da, bop, 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 bop. That's what he wants to hear. And he's trying to figure out what is the best way to get that. So the first note is an eighth note, and it's long. B, da, and then they're all short quarter notes after that. B, short, long, short, 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 short. And I'm again singing the wrong pitches because I imagine this going down to C, even though it doesn't. So that's what he wants to have happen. And... It's tricky because, yes, you can write a staccato quarter note, and it's going to sound good for the first three beats here. But you have this weird situation that music notation just doesn't have a good answer for of, well, what happens if you want a short note that's tied across the bar line, right? You, you want these quarter notes can be written as quarter notes. You don't need ties to write them. Some people would tell you to um, break up that E in the middle of the measure to break it up with a tie because it's connecting the and of two into beat three. But in styles of music in which this type of syncopation is common, this is made an exception. We say, yeah, it's okay. You don't have to show the middle of the measure 
if you have this rhythm, because this rhythm is common enough, at least in genres where it is common. So in jazz in particular, or any form of Latin American music and several others, uh, um, that's going to happen. So yeah, this is basically the question. How do we, given that when we can have our quarter notes in the middle of the measure, you know, anywhere within the measure written as quarter notes and staccato, but if you've got a note on the and of four, it needs to be tied over the bar line to make it a uh, to make it a quarter note. And now there's the question: Well, how do you notate that it's staccato? And the answer is nah, there is no good answer. And I don't just mean from U scores playback; I mean in general. So this looks weird. This looks strange. So even if this worked for playback. I mean, they all look strange. There is no good answer. I, I can't emphasize that enough. There is no good answer. But if we listen to what this sounds like here, um, we heard the staccato E, but then it got tied, and so it sounded longer than the rest, right? It, it's longer than the rest because of the tie. So then he says, well, what happens if, and, and it looks weird, right? It, it looks weird to say, I'm going to play this note short, but then I'm also going to hold it. That just looks weird, right? It doesn't make sense. Um, so, well, then the next thought is, well, what if I uh, choose to not tie it? This to me is the best answer notationally, maybe. Um, and so, Graham, I'm going to get to your observation in a second, because that's the third alternative. You're doing a good job of anticipating all the inter all the alternatives. So Dave's question about does the tie make sense? No, not really. And so that's why alternative two comes up. Alternative two says, hey, let's just make it be an eighth note. Um, so the eighth note and mark it staccato because, well, the rest are staccato. It feels like that should make sense also. But if you play it, that E is just too short. Right? Those, those eighth notes staccato are too short. That's because MuseScore has, MuseScore's algorithm says play staccato notes for exactly 50% of the length of the note. If you make a staccato whole note, it'll be a half note, which makes no sense at all. But that's the algorithm it uses because somewhere in some book, someone said that's how to interpret staccato. I think that's nonsense. Staccato, staccato really means detached. If I were to come up with my best algorithm for what staccato should mean, Staccato quarter notes and staccato eighth notes are about the same length. Um, they're about the length of a sixteenth note, maybe a little longer. I don't know. It depends on the tempo also. Um, and so, but then staccato sixteenth notes, are those shorter than sixteenth notes? Well, yes, then you put in a tiny little break also. It's, it's impossible to get really super specific about what the staccato dot means because it depends on tempo, depends on style. But I'm going to come back to this one because of all the options provided, um, this one has a certain appeal, but I'm going to come back to it. Okay. So, um, Oh, well, why not make the first eighth note a pickup? Because it's not. If if this is on the beat, I mean, think about the rest of the band. If the rest of the band is going bum, 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 da, uh, 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 and, and the rest of the band is playing the quarter notes, you know, the beat is the beat. We're not going to change the beat just to make that notation work better. Um, so we're talking about cases that really are syncopated like this. So I'm going to come back to alternative two. So um, can the 50% be adjusted is Steiner's question. So the answer is no, not currently, not currently. Um, the framework is in place so that MuseScore 4, maybe not 4.0, but maybe 4.1 or something, some MuseScore 4 release will most likely give you controls over that because they have put the framework in place to let articulations have more 
uh, qualities. But even if you can't change the default for what artic for what that dot does, I'm going to show you what we can do. All right, I will show you the things we can do. All right. So next, I'm going to go to alternative three. Um, yeah, Warren tied to a sixteenth note. Yeah, you could do that, but I, I would claim that that is a even if it gives you the right playback, I definitely don't want to see that. Definitely don't want to see that. Um, so um, next alternative, he's like, well, let's make all of them short eighth notes. So this is not bad. This is not bad. Not bad at all. You might look at, you might listen to the playback and go, yeah, but now those eighth notes are too short. But then I might question whether staccato is actually the right thing. What we really want is for those to be fat notes, is, is what I'm thinking stylistically. Um, fat as opposed to short is a term that we sometimes use. So there is different articulations that sometimes get used for this, but I'm going to select all those staccato markings in this measure. I'll click one, shift click another to select them all. You all know you could do that. You can. And now I'm going to open the palette and I'm going to try a different marking. I'm going to try the marcato. Now marcato is going to make them accented also and short. Let's hear what this sounds like in MuseScore. It's a little longer than the staccato and a little accented. I might claim that that is actually the more proper articulation for the effect I think you want. I, yeah, I can't tell you what you want, but in any case, it's worth considering. But I guess the question is more whether I want to see all those rests there. Whether I want to see those rests or not, can't really, I mean, I can't answer that for you. Um, uh, but what if I just wrote it with no articulations at all? You know, that is not terrible either. just by writing the note with the rest tells us something about this being a note with some space around it. So maybe that's all I need. And then instead of a legato marking, I might use a slur, although if I'm writing for trombone, not. That might be a clear way to write this and have the playback be reasonable also. Um, the last alternative that he wrote was similar to that but he wrote the staccato dot on the first note only with the idea being to kind of give people a hint that these should be short and then let them use their own judgment after that, right? So um, these are all possibilities, right? And again, even not thinking about MuseScore, just what is the best to write is, is um, it's, it's honestly a good question. Um, so what I will tell you, if you're worried about the playback is you can select these staccato markings. And now if I open the inspector, I can turn off their playback. And so I can write the staccato marking, but have them not play back staccato, just have them right. These I didn't turn off the playback of, so those are still playing back staccato. So anytime you're not happy with the playback of a note based on its articulation, you can use the inspector to turn off the playback of that note. Uh, I mean, not of the note, of the articulation. Then you might select the notes themselves. Whoops, I wanted to press shift click shift click here to select the notes. And now I will reopen the inspector. I keep closing the inspector just to save room because I do like to keep the chat open at once, but there's only so much room on my screen. Um, let me close my palettes for a moment. Now I can go to the palette. I, I've selected those notes and now uh, I can change their velocity here, except that doesn't work for um, 
velocity settings don't work for uh, wind instruments uh, for complicated MIDI reasons. Um, but what I can do is use plugins. I can use the articulation plugin. Um, the articulation, actually, I'll use the one called Doc Articulate. Doc Articulate is a pretty clever plugin. So download it if you don't have it, if you, if you think this might be useful. I'm going to select this range of notes. And then I will go ahead and right click. Actually, I think I can do it with the range selection in this. It says it's got four notes selected. And then what I can do is change their off time. A thousand, so this is in not percents, but per thousandths. So a thousand would mean keep it full length. I could say make it 75% or 750 thousandths and then say apply. Now, that was 75% length. If you're not sure if it really worked, like I'm not, <laughs> let's try it again. I'm going to apply 250, which will make them be super short and hit apply and see if that works. Yeah, so that Doc Articulate plugin, there's also a one that's just called Articulation, but that one's bit better for like individual uh, articulations. The Doc one is nice because then it stays open. And then every time you make a selection, you can then apply an articulation to it. So it's really quite useful. Um, uh, so yeah, it's it's quite useful to be able to um, uh, use that doc articulate. So it's it's just called articulation control. When you go to the plugins uh, page on musicore.org, it's um, uh, that's what it's called. Okay, so now Dave makes the observation that I almost made and then didn't because because I didn't. But Dave, you're you're right on it. Um, this makes very little sense, but I'm going to do it anyhow. Delete the staccato marking from there. Actually, I'm going to leave it there and then add it also to here. If I do this, this makes zero sense at all. But it kind of worked, right? Kind of worked. Did I did, did I use that articulation control on this? Now I can't remember. Let me uh, wrong, wrong thing. I might have used the articulation control on that one. But in any case, this idea of adding the staccato dot after the tie gives you the right playback, but it's silly. It makes no sense at all. But if you did that and then set it invisible, but no, I don't think that this is a meaningful way to notate it. Trying to notate with a tie and then say it's also short is sending mixed signals. And so it's just... It's just not a good idea. For similar reasons, we don't typically use ties and drum notation because it just doesn't make sense. Unless you're talking about a ringing, a suspended cymbal roll or any sort of roll on drums, uh, that doesn't make sense. So this was a long time on that question, but a lot of other questions came up um, along the um along the way. So uh that was good. And so now by all means. Uh, keep asking questions whether it relates to this or about something else. Colleen is asking the difference between control and shift. So we're talking about um, selecting. Um, and I see your question, Dave, about legato and staccato. I'll come back to that. Um, so uh, the difference between control and shift, if I click a note and then shift click another, it selects that entire range. And you can see it drew a rectangle around it. This is called a range selection. Range selections allow you to do certain things like copy and paste. You need a range selection to copy and paste. And a lot of other things might require range selections. Con so clicking one thing and shift clicking something else will create a range selection if they're notes. For dot, for other markings like staccato dots, if I click one and shift click another, it selects all the staccato dots within that range. So click and shift click is not just in MuseScore, but every single program does that. Like if I click the word curiously, oops, um, curiously, and then shift click the word effect, look at that, it just selected that entire paragraph, right? So clicking something, shift clicking something else is always the way in pretty much any program to select a range of things. Control click is the way to select discontiguous things. So I click this note, control click this, control click that uh, bar line, 
control click this uh, staccato dot. And now I have this discontiguous heterogeneous um, selection that consists of different disconnected items. Control click is how you select disconnected elements. And, and that's also true of maybe not all programs because not all programs support discontiguous selections at all. But if they do, that's how you do it. All right. So Dave has also pointed out about staccato and um, uh, um, legato on the same note. And the, the claim is that this doesn't make sense. And I agree that if the world were entirely logical, it wouldn't make sense. But the world is not entirely logical. And in fact, this is a fairly standardized marking. Um, but instead of adding it as two separate symbols like that, we use the combined symbol here, which kind of lays them out together. At one point, there was plans to make these combined so that like if you added one, then added together, it would convert to the other, but that just never happened. Um, but this is a note. This is an articulation that has meaning, <laughs> but its meaning is very, very context-dependent. This is another way of saying that fact uh, thing. Oh, and look, it'll even tell you right here, 670% or per thousands uh, is what it'll do. So uh, th that marking there is going to make it last 670% uh, or 67% basically is what that marking does. It is a marking that you will see in jazz scores. You will see in concert, you'll see in wind instrument scores in a variety of things, but you will find very little agreement about what exactly it means. So, And the same with some of these other ones, like this guy here that's got the marcato and staccato together, or accent and staccato, or accent and legato. No one, no one agrees on exactly what they mean. That doesn't stop people from using them anyhow. Sometimes people will put a little key at the beginning of their score saying which is which, what they mean. Steiner is also asking, if you export a MIDI file that used the plugin, will the change duration follow? Yes, absolutely. Anything, once it's there, it's there in your score, and uh, it will uh, get preserved on export. Whether it's export to MIDI or export to audio, it will be exported. Because MIDI just means the note off message will come earlier. Because if you know how MIDI works, note on, note off. And uh, uh, so the note off message will come earlier. Okay, um, so the question is, have I missed anything? So now I'm going to flip back to here to see if I see hands up. I don't see hands up. Um, what else? Um, are there questions in here? Peter, I see one. I'm going to come back to there in a second if I didn't, uh, if I've... Uh, Type of accent most often performed like staccato, not fat. Okay, yeah, so that's what you meant. And Dave has also mentioned about string, pizzicato. Yeah, and string, pizzicato is a, is, is a short effect, although it's different than short bowing, right? Pizzicato is going to inherently be quieter, and it's harder to do while also, like if you go, you, it's hard to go long, short, short. You can't like play a long note and then play the rest pizzicato. That's not like physically feasible to constantly go back and forth between bowed and string did like in the same measure, I mean, bowed and pits in the same measure. So de, da, uh, 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 you, you'd probably no take them with up bows, strokes or down bow strokes, whatever, but D um, maybe up, down, 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 because the down bows will give it a natural accent and then you'd mark it short and then, but tell people still play at Arco. But yeah, pits will make it shorter, but it, it might be too short and too quiet and too hard to mix in with the staccato notes. Um, so, uh, so there's that. And let me just see if there was anything else that I missed. I think not that there was anything else that I missed. Um, uh, Dan's quick question here, are office hours recorded? No. The, um, this is a conscious choice that the office hours that I do on Tuesdays um, that are available for uh, Gold Level members, it's, it's a place where everyone can kind of talk freely. And I don't want to have to worry. I mean, it's not like we're using it to like trash things or, or whatever, but I don't want to have to worry about, it. are you okay with other, you know, with this being posted uh, somewhere where others could see it later or anything like that. So rather than worry about privacy issues or anything like that, the office hours are live only. 
Um, but mostly it's an opportunity for you to ask questions um, just like this, but get to ask them in person once a week. So office hours are great for that, but they are live only. All right. So um, so Peter's asking about things like in that Amy Beach thing to say English text by. So it's a second lyricist line below the first. So let's let's see. Let's see about that. Um, so strings absolutely do use staccato notation. Yes, yes, they definitely use staccato notation. And you can use staccato and pizzicato, but it's not really all that meaningful. It might mean you play it even pitsier than usual. You stop it with your other finger so it doesn't even vibrate after plucking it. Um, that's probably more of a thing for like bass or cello where the note is likely to ring violin, the note's going to be short enough not to matter. But um, yeah, staccato is absolutely a marking for strings uh, to mean short while bowing. Um, okay, so uh, the question here is about things like adding multiple lyricist lines. So I'm going to add uh, my title, my composer, and my lyricist. And then uh, you want to add another line. Well, there's no room to, you can't add multiple lines of text within the lyricist field here. But what I can do is go ahead and finish creating the score and I'll create it the way we know it is. If you know, if you've been doing the engraving uh, workshop, you know that was a score we've been working on that's voice and piano. And so now we have lyricist. Well, I just double click that and go ahead and hit enter. English text by so and so. So now I have the lyricist two lines. Now, the thing is that this information is actually recorded as part of the score. The information you entered when you first created the dialogue is entered in the score's metadata. And that's useful information. It stays with the score. I think it stays even when you export to PDF. It stays when you upload to musecore.com. This information is useful information that's attached to your file, but doesn't necessarily display in it. Like you're looking at it and going, well, I see that information. Yeah, but if I go to file, score properties, you'll see under lyricist, it still just says lyricist. Just because I edited what shows up on the score doesn't mean I've edited the metadata. So if I want to um, uh, get the metadata to have two lines in it, what I'll do is I will now select this with the line break and all, copy. Now I can go to score properties and paste. And even though you don't see the multiple lines, it works out that way. And by the way, uh, if you had any doubt about whether it was showing up there, I'm gonna add that metadata to the header. That's something that we don't see every day, but I'm gonna show you, because I know people often like to have multi-line copyright messages, the same exact thing applies. So if I go to the header and then I say, go ahead and show on the first page and right smack dab in the middle, I wanna enter metadata. I wanna enter lyricist. So it will be, I need to hover over this thing and remember how it works. It's, it's, dollar sign colon tag colon. So dollar sign tag, dollar sign colon lyricist colon. So the lyricist will now show up in my header. And there it is right there, right smack dab on top of the title where I don't want it, right? But you can see it is in fact two lines. And this is something, the fact that it was right smack dab on top of the uh, title, that's what I mentioned sometime quite recently, somewhere or other, that it's it's really a bug um, that the that header doesn't, MuseCore doesn't automatically make room for header. So what I need to do is go to format, uh, style, and then under text styles, find header in the list somewhere towards the top there, header, and set it to be a negative offset. Like usually negative five is enough for a one line header, but it's not enough for a two line header. So I better make it higher still, maybe 10 millimeters. And now you look at it and go, well, gee, that's awful close to the top margin of the page. 
but that's okay. Now I will go to format page settings and increase the page margin. And this one unfortunately doesn't update in real time. So I'll have to hit apply to see the result. And now there's enough room there. So anyhow, that's, um, that's a little bit about uh, multiple line, uh, multiple lines in metadata. So hopefully that helps with that. Um, all right. So Bernard is asking, can you connect six eighths with a, uh, with a beam by default in three, four? Yes, you absolutely can. So let's do that. Um, let's create a score. Let's uh, just use the standard treble clef template and uh, let's tell it we want three, four. Here's my three, four score. Whoops, I want eighth notes. And I got a bunch of eighth notes. So by default, it's going to beam them in groups like this, each beat separately. So if you want to change the default, what you're going to do is right click the three, four. Hmm. Actually, let me, let me do something first. I'm going to add some more instruments to this score. All right. I'm now going to right click the three, four here and say time signature properties. And this brings up the time signature properties dialog. Um, and now what I'm going to do is use these controls here by clicking on a note that's not currently beamed it'll beam it. By clicking one that is currently beamed, it'll unbeam it. This overrides, this basically changes the default. So now the default is all of these. You can also use these icons down at the bottom of the dialog to create fancier, um, uh, fancier defaults. But now I've got all six eighths beamed. So I do that. And sure enough, all the eighths are beamed. However, it only did that staff beam pro i mean the the time signature properties are per staff so the trick now is to get other staves to use that same three four i got a couple ways to do that if this is something you're going to do often you might want to open your time signatures palette and just control shift drag that three four in there and then now you have a special 3-4 that is um, the special 3-4. And now if I add that special 3-4 to the score, it affects everything, right? So that totally worked. Now, when you look at this, you'll wonder, well, how do I know it's my special 3-4? Well, what I can do is right-click it and say, whoops, did I change which one I was right-clicking? Right-click the 3-4 properties and I'm going to change its name to... Uh, all beamed three four. Now, when I hover over it, it says all beamed three four. So I remember that that's my special three four. So that's something you might want to do. Now, as an alternative to that, if you don't feel like customizing your palette for it, you can actually control shift drag that time signature directly to another measure, and. Control shift drag will allow you to copy things within a score that don't normally copy. It's not the most well-known feature. Like in this this week's newsletter, I talked about the uh, the fact that that line, a uh, note attached line is a pretty unknown feature. This cloning feature where you can copy and paste things that don't normally copy and paste. Um, or you can copy things that don't normally copy and paste. It's not a very well-known feature, but it does exist. And I can use it, I think, for key signatures too. Check this out. I'm going to drag this, control shift, drag this over here. And now I have a key signature over here. Oh, look at that. It changed because it, 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 got the, it transposed it twice. So that's silly. It doesn't even work well. This is what I mean about this feature. Not particularly well tested, but it works for some things. So if it works, it works. Um, so yeah, it, it, it is Dave unfortunate that that, uh, di that, that, uh, dialogue box there for entering the title and stuff doesn't have multiple, uh, lines in it. Um, but I am, oh, oh no, you're actually talking about the frame itself. Um, although this frame, yeah, vertical frames don't expand automatically unless 
It does for like, you know, if you keep adding information to title, it does. But for items like this, it it expands, it 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 changes the alignment, but let me go back here and uh, delete all the rest of the title. So it does expand for the sake of the title, um, but actually it is expanding for the lyricist too. There are certainly some cases where title frames don't expand. Um, uh, well, for one thing, if you've disabled that, and that's a relatively new feature, by the way, automatic expanding frames uh, for titles only became a feature around 3.5 or 3.6 or so. Um, and it's not perfect. There are some text items that it doesn't, it can't account for, or if they're dragged out of position. It can't account for that properly. But if you've added things in their default positions, the default elements at their default positions in current versions of MuseScore, it actually does expand automatically, at least for scores created in newer versions. If you're editing a score originally created in an older version, you'll have to enable that manually. So let me show you where that is. Let me open the inspector, select the frame, and right here where it says enable auto size. So if you have a score that was created in an older version of MuseScore, auto size was disabled. Auto size will be disabled because that feature didn't exist in those old versions. So uh, you'll have to manually enable it. All right, I'm caught up. I'm caught up on questions, I think. Uh, let me... Uh, hop over to the participants raise hand area this is kind of cool that um uh i can i can check this way for the raise hand thing so again if i've missed your question feel free to use the raise hand and then you know maybe i can go hunt for the question frankly it might be just as easy to just ask again <laughs> but just or tell me Scroll up and find it. Um, try to put notes in under the title. Yeah, so if you try to put additional text in the field, that is likely to not work, especially if you are um, using. So usually, let me um, let, let me uh, actually do this a little bit more. Let me edit it, this lyricist field again. Come on. And uh, get rid of all those extra lines. Mm -mm -mm -mm. And this time I'm just gonna add text. So I'm gonna right click the field and say add, add text. And I add blah, 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 blah. And notice it does add, it, it does create room for it. However, if I then drag this item down here, no, it doesn't. So it's not going to work for manually positioned items like that. So instead, I'm going to reset this. And if I want it to appear at the bottom and centered, I'm going to use the inspector to make that happen. So I'm going to go over to the inspector and I'm going to tell it to center. And I'm going to tell it to be uh, bottom uh, aligned. And now you'll see it is adding extra space and still, you know, uh, doing kind of what you want. Now, there is a question, well, is did you want more space between the two? And you might be a little bit stuck there because I think if I try to select this and move it down, it's not going to work. And I don't think that there's a way to define like a margin between these. So yeah, there are certain types of formatting that when you do them, you might need to expand the, the, the frame yourself. I will suggest though, rather than add to the title frame, add a separate frame. That's what I usually do. I'll add a separate text frame below the title frame. So for stuff like this, let me just cut that text. I'm going to go here and I'm going to say add frames insert text frame. And now I have a text frame. I guess I can't type that text. I, I pasted a text element rather than the text itself. Now I can add my text in that separate frame. And I do now have separate control over the gap. I just select that frame and say, I want the gap to be zero. And then I can also select the top frame and select its bottom gap to be less, right? 
So this, when I'm creating layouts that have a title frame and then additional notes, this is how I usually do it. Because you want the lyricist and composer to be close to, if there is a lyricist, you want the composer to be close to the title and the rest of the text usually to be below the composer. So this would be the more common layout. But yeah, many layouts are possible. Um, some of them might just take in a little bit of, uh, some might just take a little bit of, uh, a little bit of fiddling around, but it should generally be possible. All right, I'm again caught up. Um, so uh, what other questions can I answer? I'll give people a few moments for questions and you know, if I don't hear any other questions, I will happily wrap up. Um, but I wanna give people time to, uh, you know, try to get everyone's uh, questions answered. And um, yeah, Dave also, I, I, you made a comment that's also a very good comment and a very and an, an annoyance in MuseScore, I would say, if you do select two tied notes, well, let me just enter them in a new score. If I enter two tied, if I enter some tied notes and I select that whole range and then I say, hey, let's enter staccato on them and press shift S. It entered staccato on all of them, including both halves of the tied notes. Realistically, MuseScore should try to be smarter and say, you know what, when you have tied notes, certain markings don't make sense to add to both sides of the tie. The, 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 the question is which markings will make sense, which won't. Probably most of them don't, but um, in any case, there's some programming logic someone would have to figure out to do the right thing in, in all cases. Um, Okay, so let me, um, uh, while I wait to see if I get any other questions in, I'll just uh, give people a moment or two and talk a little bit more about the, uh, the workshops that are going on now. The, um, uh, uh, the music engraving workshop, uh, one of the things that we're doing, and I see a couple of the people who are now participating in this. Remember last week's cafe, I talked about OpenScore and that OpenScore string quartet project. So we're we're using one of the string quartets as our project piece for the month and have and I'm having people work on one of the string quartets that is actually one that they're working on for open school. So if people's work ends up being good uh, and want to try to submit it by the end of the month, we'll, we'll do our best to, to help people get really good results. Um, maybe uh, the end result with will be one of these Mozart string quartets will be uh, come part of open score as part of this. So that's one of the things that I'm trying to do with the engraving workshop is get people's skills up to the level where you can partic participate in projects like that for the betterment of the world. And uh, the open score people have their own way of uh, rewarding that, which is great. Um, so, uh, so uh, Susan asked about open score string quartet problems. I'm not sure where you asked. So I didn't see anything in the in my community. You might have asked over on musecore.com. I'm not sure, um, but I'll I'll take a look. Uh, if you posted it somewhere in the community. So let me show you what the community looks like if you're not accustomed to looking at the community. The community is, uh, I guess I gotta open a new window for it. Give me a give me a moment here. The community is this site right here, where you came to for this very stream, and it's gonna take its time loading. Um, but uh, anyhow, so obviously you you managed to join the community if you found the stream. And uh, so somewhere in here could be where you might have, where you, if, if you want me to see your question, this is the place to be posting it. So if it's about music engraving workshop, you'd come over here to music engraving workshop and uh, post your question somewhere in here. All right. Um, so I did see question come in about dynamics. So let me try to get to that now. Um, Oh, there's first, what is courteous for getting assistance for arranging? That's a good question. By courteous, you mean if you are arranging someone's piece and then you ask for help and someone gives you some advice, 
I would say unless they actually wrote a significant amount of it, you don't need to give credit for that. That's sort of normal and to be expected that when people are composing or arranging music, they might ask for advice along the way. I mean, uh, tons of music that's been composed or arranged has had advice along the way. Um, so um, I wouldn't feel compelled to, um, I wouldn't feel compelled to credit that, but if it feels like above and beyond the call of duty, sure, by all means. Um, Dave's asking about uh, some scores where dynamics are different. So again, as always, post to the support forum, attach your score, we'll have it solved within minutes. Um, probably, if you are seeing the dynamics not having the effect you want, my guess would be either they've had their values altered in the inspector or the notes have had their values and the velocity value specifically altered in the inspector because the velocity value in the inspector takes precedence over whatever the normal dynamic behavior is. So if you're seeing something that's a little odd, probably there's been a velocity override applied via the inspector. Post your score to the support forum. Someone will have you sorted out momentarily, I'll bet. Um, but uh, the other thing that could be is if they're attached to the wrong staff. If you have like, um, you know, two staves and you've attached it to this staff and then dragged it down closer to the to this staff below, it's still attached to the top staff and it's still affecting that staff. Again, these are the kind of things that once you attach your score, we can tell you absolutely rather than having to guess. Um, okay, so, um, so there you go. I'm caught up again. Uh, let me let me just show where the uh, where that setting is. So I'll get. Uh, let me come over to the cafe theme, and cafe theme. If I click uh, a dynamic marking, and then I go over to the inspector, which sometimes doesn't want to open. Come on, you. There we go. Um, inspector. Uh, in that in the dynamic you'll see there is the velocity setting and that's what controls mf's velocity that particular dynamic markings velocity and so it'll affect all the following notes unless any given note did it stop playing oh it's it's the that's right it's uh it's got the mute blah, blah, blah. um let me select a different note if i want this note to be louder than the rest or softer than the rest i select that note and come over to the velocity field and it will override it. So um, uh, so this is how you will see it. You will look, you will click. So if you've downloaded a score, click the click the dynamic and then come over to the inspector to see its velocity. And then you'll also need to check each of the individual notes to see if its velocity, if their velocities have been overridden. And of course, remember between two different staves, the mixer might have uh, you know, like here, I've pulled the trombone volume down because it was too loud relative to the others for the same dynamic. I find that generally true for the trombone uh, in the default sound font, so I often do this. Um, but yeah, if in the mixer someone has pulled one staff down, then yeah, all of its dynamics will be different. So again, if you're having trouble, we're happy to help. Just post your score to the support forum. So um, again, I'm caught up and I'm now, you know, definitely at point where I feel uh, ready to wrap up. So I'm going to. I'm going to thank everyone for your questions and uh, comments along the way. We covered a bunch of different material here. A lot of it via um, uh, a lot of it via um, about playback and but about other things too so i'm glad my playback was i was able to get it working again or i would have uh, had a lot of problems here um and susan i will definitely try to find your question if i can if it's something i can help with i will um but if it was something over on musecore.com and it's about open score specifically i'm not the open score expert i'm a MuseScore expert, but I'm not an open score expert. So if it's about the logistics of the open score project, probably best to ask over there on MuseScore.com. So um, thanks again, everyone. Next week um, is second week of the month. I don't have a particular topic in mind, but I am going to tell you 
I think we're getting real close to MuseCore 4 Alpha release, a public alpha release. Whether it happens by next Tuesday or not, I don't know, but I think it's probably coming this month. So probably sometime soon, you're going to see a MuseCore 4 demo here. So um, uh, well, maybe next week, maybe maybe in a couple weeks, maybe three, whatever. Um, but thanks again, everyone, and I will see you next time.